In this episode of Mind Pump, so we don't talk too much about fitness in this episode. We talk about podcasting. Podcast. We talk all about how to create a successful podcast. Like how do you start one and how do you make one that's impactful and one that can become a business? As you guys know, Mind Pump started five years ago and has turned into uh, quite the fun business for us. So we talk about you know what worked for us and what we see working for other podcasters. We start out with the episode by talking about the statistics around podcasts, how fast they're growing, and what the future looks like for podcasting, and why podcasting is the highest converting mm -hmm. form of new media around. Then we talk about the four things you should focus on if you want to be a successful podcast. We start out by talking about how to be an expert. Then we move on to talking about effective communication or how to communicate well. We talk about consistency, that's very important. And then we finally talk about encouraging community and why that's important if you want to be a successful podcaster. Now, before the episode starts, it's January and our best, most effective fat burning workout program that we have, this one's excellent for fat burning, especially in the short term, it's MAPS HIT. Remember, hit them, Sal. Remember, HIT stands for High Intensity Interval Training. Now, we have programmed it so you're doing HIT the right way with resistance training to maximize fat loss. Here's how you get the 50% off because it's on sale. Go to mapshit.com. That's M-A-P-S-H-I-I-T and use the code HIT50, H-I-I-T, five zero, no space for the discount. What's one of the top questions that you guys get in your DMs that it's not fitness it's not fitness related. It's not fitness related. Like, what's the number one? How do I pick up chicks? Yeah. What? Yeah. No, you get that all the time. Do you really? Yeah, yeah I do. I get like that yeah. with pickup lines and stuff of like that. People used to ask all the time. Oh, that's really? funny. Yeah, yeah. No, that wasn't where you're going. On good form. Oh, no. Terribly. <laughs> yeah. It was a terrible. Assist. You guys don't get people DMing you how to start uh, uh, a successful start podcast. A podcast. Yeah. yeah, I do get that every now and then. I get sure. that all the time um, as a as a DM, and we even see it in our our qua when we put up the qua meme. And we get questions underneath. That's like a re reoccurring non-fitness related question. I actually just literally uh, text someone that, uh, yeah. message someone that that was messaging me. So I do get it. I'm just teasing you. Yeah. Uh, it is very, really pop, And it's becoming more popular. Dude, the when we first started Mind Pump. There's so many of them. Almost five. It was five years ago. I remember people would ask me, hey, what do you do or whatever? And it's always, I start a podcast and people would be like, what's a podcast? Yeah, do you remember that? Yeah, no, I totally oh, yeah. do. I still am not used to the the transition we've gone through because I got so used to the first two or three years of having to explain it all the time that I go right into explaining what I do, right? Instead of just saying like, oh yeah, we, we have a podcast. It was a lot like, uh, you remember when the iPod came out and like everybody like totally loved iPod and all this. And then mm -hmm. I would, I talked to somebody and was like, yeah, whatever iPod's done. Like I, I listened to a Zune. I'm like, what the fuck is a Zune? <laughs> that was like what I felt like when I would say I, I have a podcast. Yeah, yeah. yeah where people are like, I have what? a Zune. You no, know, I, it, the, I immediately felt like I had to explain I have like a real job. That's what I felt like. Yeah, <laughs> yeah that's like, right. Like, oh, so you're saying you're unemployed. That's what you yes. Dude, the the growth, Good luck with that. The growth of podcasting over the last five years has exploded, especially over the last two two or three years. Like I, I was bring I was pulling up statistics. So in, this is 2018 statistics. Okay, so this is just a year ago. Seventeen percent of Americans say that they had listened to a podcast, uh, you know, in the last month. Seventeen percent in 2019, twenty six percent, almost double. Ooh. In one in one year, you went uh, almost ten percent growth from 2018 to 2019, which that constitutes millions and millions of Americans. I it's, guess that's not almost double. Sorry, yeah, it's I'm the math guy. I don't I know how that happened. Yeah, when you do that. Be 34. Yeah. Sorry, it's it's ex <laughs> it's exploding. But what's really cool is that the it, the potential the potential for growth is still massive. What we're at is the the beginning of the rapid increase in uh, you know podcast awareness. It's like the very beginning of shit exploding. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. Because still to this day, 56 percent of Americans have never listened to a podcast. So still over half yeah. today have never listened to one. But 92% of Americans listen to the radio 
on a regular basis. Well, there's two problems they solve right away. I mean, being able to listen and then carry that conversation with you outside of your car was a huge thing for me because I remember listening to the radio and I would get into shows and I get into the conversation and then I had to go do stuff. Right. You know, right. and then it's Work like, started. yeah, and then you miss out. And then it's like, I, I would always like uh, hear about it later from people in conversation and try and catch up that way. And then they totally, uh, I mean, provided that extension where it's like, it's, it's such a convenient feature. Well, we see it's uh, the writing is on the wall with uh, video and movies mm -hmm. and television, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, it's uh, it's right there for us if you don't believe it. I mean, it's it's obvious uh, what has happened with streaming television. Oh, yeah. Cable it's, is, is going to be dead. gone. Yeah, it's yeah. dead. It's completely dead. Um, or not completely. It's almost. It's completely. on its way to yeah, dying. Yeah, it's on its way. And uh, and it makes total sense why you why everybody is going the streaming route uh, for those reasons like you're naming right now, Justin. And literally, podcasting is the radio dude, version of that. Dude, back in the day, the way everybody watched TV was with their antenna. They had an antenna on the top of the house, and the TV had an antenna, and you tuned in to stations. Then cable became a thing. And I remember in the 80s, in the 80s is when cable really started to come out. Uh, MTV was one of the first stations or whatever to push cable. Yeah. Um, they came out with the Music I want, videos. like I want my MTV or yeah. whatever. Please give me cable. I want my MTV. Cable now. No, who the hell watches TV with antenna? You know, tuning in. Nobody does. It's gone. Yeah. The same thing is happening with cable with streaming. Very soon, very quickly, it's going to be totally gone. The same thing is hap. It's going to happen to radio. Radio is going to be dead, and it's going to be all streaming audio, and that's where podcast really shines. So if, if, if so, when people are seeing this, and advertisers are seeing this because they're looking at the whole radio market, which was massive, mm -hmm. still massive, but declining very quickly. That's the market that's going to move over to digital audio, which includes podcasting. Well, and the point that you always like to make that is, is so true in this case is the how low the uh, barrier to entry is. That's yeah. I mean, it's like that is it's, it's because of the bandwidth is huge unlimited part of it. Even, yeah, even when we when we first all talked, I'll never forget when. Uh, we thought of the idea of doing it. I mean, I was clueless to how inexpensive it was. And I remember when Doug was like, oh yeah, I have most of the, the most equipment already. And I'm like, what? Yeah. And they were like, how does it? Put, how do we yeah. put it up? And he's like, yeah. we just put it up. Yeah. We yeah. Like, <laughs> yeah, we didn't even need this huge professional studio right away. Yeah. We, yeah, we just ran it out of his living room. Yeah, we did. And um, again, it's just, it, and here it, it's because there's an unlimited bandwidth with uh, technology because in the in, back in the day, you only had so many radio stations. It was limited. Um, you couldn't just create a new radio station. So to get on a radio station, there were a lot of doors you had to walk through. There were a lot of barriers. There were a lot of people you had to that you know had to be satisfied with what we were going to do. Mind Pump 100% would not exist if the podcasting space didn't exist. So today, because the bandwidth is unlimited, anybody can start a podcast. That's both good and bad. It's good because now anybody, if you're listening right now and you want to start a podcast, it's great. Mm -hmm. um, it, can, it may, can it be challenging? Yes, it can be challenging to become the biggest podcast in the world, but you could je definitely build a nice loyal audience uh, if you do a pretty- Well, if you job. have compelling points and you're an expert in a field, I mean, that's a massive advantage that you have coming into it because, totally. you know, there's, again, this is what you saw on YouTube too, where it was like, they're finding like real talent and stars, you know, from formats like that, that would have never got exposure but it was that they were that good that they shined through all those people. So uh, ad revenue for podcasts in 2018 was well over half a billion dollars. Wow. That was 2018. It's growing exponentially, meaning it's growing faster and faster and faster. And we're probably five years away, maybe 10 at most from podcast revenue being one of the, it's going to be one of the number one places that companies spend uh, money on ads. And the reason for that is of all of the new media platforms, podcasts convert the highest. Yeah. They just do. If you And when you look at the different uh, media platforms, each one of them has like a conversion rate, right? So like, uh, you know, Instagram has a certain conversion rate versus Facebook versus YouTube. The longer and more profound the content is allowed to be, the more, the, the better the conversion rate is. So 10,000 listeners on a podcast is equivalent to like, you know, 150,000 or 200,000 or more people on YouTube or millions of people on Instagram because it's long format. You're mm -hmm. listening to the person's in your ear. So when it comes to selling a product or promoting or influencing people, podcasting is king. 
It's well, absolute king. I, I also think it's it starts to niche down your audience better than any other thing too, right? Like when you watch something like a, a sporting event like football, I mean, the type of people that are all tuning in, the millions of people that are watching at that moment, uh, and then they we all get hit sit with the same commercial. So, you know, I see the the same Dorito commercial as, you know, Katrina yeah. does that, you know what I'm saying? And so you, it's like, it's really hard to target us individually on what we would probably consume. Mm -hmm. And so it's very generic, right? So you're just throwing spaghetti on the wall and just hoping something sticks. Such a good point. But with advertising with a podcast, you have a, a pretty much a single topic for most part of what the, what really it encompasses, whether it be fitness or health or finance or motivation. or And within that, you have topics that are being covered by these hosts. So you can really start to understand who, who listens to these people. So even if it is only 5,000 people that are listening to you, it's a much more narrowed down avatar, which in marketing, if the, the more uh, narrowed down the avatar can be, the easier that they can uh, market to them. What, which, a, what a boon yep. for producers, because let's say you come out with a product that has a lot of success potential, but really has, you're targeting a narrow audience, but it still has a lot of potential. In the past, it would cost too much money to advertise it on a broadcast media platform. You know, like you, you invent the, for example, chili pad, like, okay, uh, how are we going to advertise this on TV? It's going to cost way too much. The conversion is not going to be good enough. It's not going to make us money. But now a company like that can target audiences that are interested in health, want to spend extra money on quality sleep or whatever. So it actually gives producers more effective avenues for advertising. And that's one of the reasons why podcasting is exploding. And that's the one, also another reason why a lot of producers are successful because now they have a, me a way to, like you said, Adam, target a specific audience. Uh, to that point, I think, I think we're, since we're doing a, a podcast around this, we should share what that looks like too. Is um, So there's a, a formula that's uh, out there for how podcasters get advertising as far as how much money should you get based mm -hmm. off of uh, how big your audience is. And it goes by you know, and and it, it, this is different from podcast to podcast. If you do a really good job, you should be able to get this number up. But there's a generic number that when you first start getting involved that most advertisers uh, and companies are looking for, and that's you know 20 to $25 uh, per CPM. And CPM represents the uh, amount of listeners, which is 1,000. So for every 1,000 listeners, you're getting paid 20 to roughly $30 mm -hmm. uh, for that ad. But you can do way better than that. Uh, some well, podcasts do four times. I mean, that was something that we saw uh, right away as we as we got into this space. We, we recognized that um, because, again, this is a very – which is uh, – I love getting into a market very similar like when I got into the cannabis industry when it was really early. When you're really early to uh, the marketplace, there's a lot of opportunity to do things better. And – you know, this is even though it's been around for nine years, it's still relatively new for the the majority. And the advertising side of the house is uh, really a clusterfuck. And we mm -hmm. saw that instantly. Mm -hmm. Like, okay, wait a second. You mean to tell me, you know, I have all this, all these years of sales experience, not only selling myself, but then also teaching others how to do it. So I've refined the skill really well, and I've been doing that for two decades. And you're going to lump me in the same category as, you know, Earl, who's 72 mm -hmm. and is never sold in his life. And he's a boring, monotone author who is talking on a podcast. <laughs> and yet, because just because we have the same amount of downloads, we're both going to get the same amount of money for advertising. Well, that's a bunch of bullshit. Mm -hmm. yeah. So, you know, we saw that opportunity. And when we started to do advertising, instead of waiting for the companies to come to us and, uh, you know, playing by their terms, we sought after companies that we knew would right. match with our audience and brands that we liked and that we would be using. And then we convinced them to spend more money with us, knowing that we would do better for right. them. Right. Now, generally speaking, generally speaking, the, the podcast audience uh, are the listeners are more are more loyal than the average consumer of other media, meaning they're more likely to tune in consistently than consumers of TV, social media, and other things. They're more affluent and they're more educated. It's actually the perfect audience. If you're trying to sell a product, that's the audience you want. You want loyal, affluent, educated people. Podcast listeners uh, fall in that category. Um, podcasters uh, or podcast listeners are much more active on every social media channel. They're far more likely to subscribe to things like Netflix and Amazon, which means they're less likely to be exposed 
to TV advertising. So podcasting is just it, and it's you know I know some people are like oh my god it's, it's so hard now or whatever no, no no you're still in the beginning believe me it's still I mean it's not like the wild west it was five years ago but it still is an incredible opportunity because what we're talking about is it's going to explode it's growing faster and faster and it's a phenomenal space to enter and there's a low barrier to entry now what are some of the there. reasons why you guys think that now I know Gary Vee's been saying this now for. At least you know five to seven years. I've been hearing him uh, tout this for a while. Like audio is going to be the very next thing. Yeah, Audio's that, king. Yeah. yeah, that that audio is going to be the future. Period. I totally and, agree. And my theory on that is because you know we're we're getting to this time where we can be doing so many things at once, like multitasking. Yeah. Dude, you can multitask. You could drive. Uh, you know, uh, Amazon um, Alexa is audio. Siri is audio. Pretty soon you'll be buying things. And hearing things audio, so I'll, instead of going on to Amazon Prime, I'll say, "Hey, you know, Alexa, you know, I'd like to buy a pair of white saw, whatever." We have these three choices. Which one would you like? How much does that one cost? It'll be a conversation. It's just a faster medium of uh, of yeah. uh, communicating. I also think there's just been a general mistrust of of media, and that's come to like its its climax. Like uh, people just don't trust the the sources of you know news out there that they're getting from people and. Uh, these are all really short soundbite conversations and there's, you know, people are just like completely sick of that format. And I think that like podcasting is is a platform that actually provides a long form conversation totally. around subjects and also even on the political sphere, like it, it brings them in to actually have a long form conversation where, uh, well, I want to know what you really like think about this policy in depth, not just like your knee jerk reaction. Totally. Cause like Joe Rogan, who's uh, one of the most widely consumed pieces of media, period, period. In fact, his podcast gets more listens or whatever, uh, you know, than, than all mainstream media news outlets combined on just his one podcast. And his episodes are two to four hours long. If you went back 10 years, 15 years, and you said, hey, we're going to make a two or three hour or four hour, you know, channel, um, what do you think? Everybody was, you're crazy. Yeah, you're crazy. That'll never you're work. You're going to lose everybody. And the reason is because we were, you know, we were reading the signals wrong. We thought that people wanted short tidbits of information because that's all we were able to deliver because the bandwidth was so short. If a politician was getting on TV or an athlete or someone was supposed to talk about something, they had five minutes, ten minutes max. So you got really good at the the taglines or whatever. Complex discussions couldn't be had because I cannot talk about fitness so I wonder, properly. I wonder if that's changing or we are just we have just provided something that attracts the more intelligent. Meaning, mm. you know, there's still the people that get you know, uh, bamboozled by Facebook ads or by YouTube short video, funny clips or clickbaity type things. Yet we still see this rise that we're talking about in podcasting. So I wonder if it's, we just didn't have the option before. Right. Like yeah. it, it, the, that's, either, that, that they're really, valid they're really intelligent people were still just getting hammered by this. that they weren't buying into it. Like a lot of the lemmings were. And somebody finally got smart and said, Hey, you know what? These smart people, there's an opportunity still to market, advertise, speak to them. They want it more in a longer form. And so what we see is less of things changing so much, and it's just get, we've, we've now provided something for more intelligent no, people. No, no, it's not just the more intelligent people. It's that this is what people have always wanted. They've always wanted complex uh, conversations to be explained properly. It's far more attractive the problem is you couldn't do it before. Yeah. If I was going to talk about fitness, no means to do it. yeah. If I was going to talk about fitness and explain fat loss, which, you know, I can talk about decently in an hour and do a good job of really communicating it properly in an hour. You put me and tell me to talk about fat loss in five minutes. I'm going to convey a shitty message. It's going to be catchy. It's going to get your attention. I don't. You know, I don't know if it's what everybody always wanted. I don't know if I agree with that because look, look, look at an example. Our YouTube channel. Uh, one of the number one complaints that we have to deal with is, you know, just get to the exercise. Just give me the tip. Just tell me what I need to do. And there's people that that are searching on there. They're using it like a Google search. Yeah, it's, you like know, it's utility though. Right. How to build my my shoulders, whatever that. They don't want to know the science. They don't want to hear about Sal or Adam talk about anything like that. Give me the fucking exercise so I can right. move along. But if you search podcast, 
So I really think that it's just a little self-selection here. It's actually the intelligent people, the people that are seeking the truth, the people that will listen an extra 20 minutes to get to the real answer. They, are, they don't think of that as wasting their time. They you're, that's starting to here's, here, okay, categorize so those people. Of course, there's always cattle those people. Of course, there's people in either camp. But here's my evidence. Okay, the most widely uh, consumed form of media before television and radio and all that were books. Uh, you had books, and they were spread everywhere. The Bible is the most widely circulated book known to man. The second most widely circulated was uh, Marco Polo's Travels. People wanted to learn and wanted information. But when you have a limited bandwidth, all you deliver are short things. And so I think, yes, there's definitely people that just want here and there. They want to hear a few things. But I think we totally miscalculated how many people want to hear the full story. Yeah. You look at the, the interview of Elon Musk with Joe Rogan. That interview of Elon Musk got way more views than any of his short interviews on NBC or whatever because people want to hear like the real stuff. And so this is a great opportunity, but it also makes it difficult if you're a bullshitter. You mm -hmm. know, if you if you don't know what you're talking about, it's hard to bullshit a podcast. Yeah, it's the great equalizer. Yeah, it's 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 easy to bullshit a short clip, you know, yeah. uh very hard. Like you get a, imagine if imagine if politicians had to get on a uh, economy podcast, a podcast with economists. They would crumble. Most of them would crumble because they're going to get asked real questions that you can't just shoot back and forth real fast. It's going to be a two-hour conversation. I don't know. I feel like we're just, I think we're just appealing to a, a smarter uh, group of people that weren't. You're trying to butter up our audience right now? Yeah. Well, it's true. If you're listening, you're probably pretty damn smart. Yeah. I mean, well, that's it's true. A, it says, it says that about Yeah, no, there's, there's, there's statistics to prove it. And I think it's more that. Uh, mm -hmm. Otherwise, um, you know, movie theaters would be less packed and libraries would be more full. I mean, it's just, there's still going to be, uh, you know, and that interview example you just gave, well, that, you know, the 22 year old, uh, you know, or 17 year old kid in high school probably didn't watch that interview. Mm. He caught the YouTube sound bite of something and wanted something short. So I still think that, I still think those short things are going to survive and they're still going to, you know, still get uh, a lot of the idiots. Sure. Just, and, and but, I, but, the which, but the conversion rate of podcasts rests on the fact that it's long form and it's influential. Yes. And you cannot influence as powerfully uh, in a short, you know, bit of time. Maybe sometimes, but that definitely not on a consistent basis. Which I, agree. Is why, I, I agree with that. Yeah, which is why podcasting is uh, such an excellent medium to get into. Uh, if you want to build a business off of media. But I think there's a few steps that are important to take uh, or to identify within yourself as to whether or not you're going to have a successful podcast because I don't think everybody or anybody can start a podcast and be successful. Yeah. Um, the number one thing that I'm going to make an argument for is, is this. If you're going to start a podcast, be an expert. Now, I don't mean you need to be a doctor or a lawyer if you're going to talk law or whatever. But what I mean is, if whatever your podcast is about, if, if all it is, is is you're having fun conversation with your friends, you should probably be a comedian or an expert communicator. Right. If, if your podcast is you know going to be about sports, you should probably know sports pretty damn well. If you're going to have a podcast about fitness, and the reason why I say that is you're going to be talking for an hour. And you're going to be doing episodes every single week. And at some point, if you don't know what you're talking about. Yeah, aimless conversations only go so far. Right. I mean, they're fun. And, and we get into that sometimes, too. And I fully enjoy those moments. But at the same time, it has to be rooted in something. And, you know, this is all with, like, trying to find your why. I mean, this is with every business. It's, it, you really do have to spend that time, uh, you know, what what is it I'm trying to convey? What is it that, you know, I'm going to try and do with this? You have to really put a lot of time in that direction and think about it. Well, I think people find a podcast like fighter and the kid for example like what do they talk about they're not they don't really talk about anything in general they just hear two guys being funny and having great conversations yeah, it's topical they're yeah. being funny and they, they, oh i could comedians. do that yeah i could do that i can get on there with my buddy no 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 you're t brian callen's been a comedian for 20 something years yeah and that's the reason why that can happen these are experts at their field or what they're doing. Well, and, and even more so than being an expert, uh, it does fall kind of on that category. I think it's more important that you just, you just add value. Mm -hmm. So, uh, and, and value sometimes could be uh, comedic relief, right? Mm -hmm. It could be that- Entertainment. Yeah, yeah. I want to be entertained. And uh, I love what, listening to the fight and the kid because they're extremely entertaining. And you're right. Uh, it's not just a couple of guys, even though they make it come off like a couple of guys just playing and goofing, 
those guys take their craft very seriously. I yeah. mean, even Brendan Schaub, who wasn't a, a comedian when he started, he pursued that to you know, sharpen his skills mm -hmm. on that side. And yes, he's always had an unbelievable co-host that is uh, intelligent and funny. Yeah. So, you know, they make it look simple and easy, but they, they are very good at their craft. At the end of the day, though, what it is is they add value. People listen to it. It's funny. It makes them laugh and smile for the day. They get to hear current events and topics. Those that love MMA, Brendan Schaub does, does a lot of stuff around that. So mm -hmm. yeah, I, every time you listen to an episode, if you're into those things you get value from it 100 percent, we would have never survived off of our skills uh in podcasting <laughs> yeah. if it wasn't for that that yeah. that at the end of the day like us uh or hate us uh you would listen to an episode and you would get valuable information like yeah. and and we, well, we talked about a subject we've been talking about for decades anus. Right? well and we were doing we were talking and why it was so valuable because at that time a lot of the stuff we were sharing was kind of paradigm shattering and counter mm -hmm. uh, common knowledge in, in our space. And that's where we, where we saw opportunity. We saw, okay, we, we have an opportunity to get into a space, share with people our experience, our knowledge over the last two decades uh, that's counter to what's being presented right now, which left us an opportunity. It's okay, nobody else is really saying this message. Yeah, we're, we're, we're not gonna be the, the best at it yet, but it's going to be compelling enough because it's going to add value to people's lives every time they listen. And that was for sure the reason why we could do otherwise. We, we, uh, even if somebody listens to the show now, cause they go, Oh my God, they're, they're fun and they're funny and they cover topics. They're like my news. So we, we hear all that now, but that was over the course of over a thousand episodes of refining our skills and improving on what we do in our craft. Right. But at the very beginning, we leaned heavily on, okay, this this has to add value, 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 value. Right. And, and the yeah. only way to really add consistent value on a long form format is to know what you're talking about. You have to be somewhat of an expert in terms of whatever it is you want to communicate. So if it's entertainment, then you should probably be an experienced entertainer. So, you know, somebody who's practiced stand-up comedy for years or improv or a presenter, maybe you're somebody who does lots of speeches and talks and you're just excellent at that. So now you have a podcast and it's entertaining and enthralling. That's that's fine. You're an expert in that. Maybe you want to talk about health. Well, you better know what you're talking about. If you want to talk about science, you better know what you're talking about because you can get away with bullshitting on a short form format. I can bullshit an Instagram post or even a short blog I can bullshit, but try to bullshit an hour long podcast day, you know, week in and week out. It's just not going to work. Stay in your lane and be an expert. That's number one for me. Cause I see a lot of people who start podcasts and, oh, I started a podcast with my friend Sal. It's pretty cool. I'm like, oh, what do you guys talk about? Yeah. Oh, we just, you know, we just talk and have fun. It's like a lifestyle podcast. Yeah. That's yeah. a big one. Oh, it's a lifestyle <laughs> podcast. <laughs> What are you? Fuck is that? Yeah, are you a lifestyle <laughs> expert? We're all doing a lifestyle yeah. right now. <laughs> I, I, I don't know very many lifestyle experts out there, and if you are one, you better damn well be entertaining and uh, very experienced in that field. So that's why I said that number one. It's almost like you got to have something to bring to the table before you try all the other stuff. You know, when it comes to you know making a successful podcast, uh, that brings us to the second one: communicate well. Learn how to communicate very, very well. Now, to start with, uh, this sounds very simple, but it's it's ridiculous how this continues to happen. Make sure you have good sound. Mm. This was Doug was huge, really big on this when we first started. He would hang up uh, blankets and make sure that there was a carpet on the floor. He would even put uh, you know a tarp, like a fluffy tarp, over the table that the, that the microphones were on when we were in his living room. And all you know, the three of us were kind of like, ah, oh, let's get this going. Let's just start the podcast. He was a stickler on sound, but studies show when people listen to anything where the su the sound isn't good, he, even if the information is good, you just want to turn it off. Well, what and especially like nowadays, like there's so many podcasts now, like, you know, they used to get away with it a bit back, you know, when it was first coming out and like, you'd have like one, uh, whatever that was called, that one mic in the middle where everybody's kind of contributing towards it, all this like feedback, you know, you're getting from that. And, uh, you know, it was sort of like the wild west, but now everybody's paying, you know, more attention to the quality of the sound. And I mean, think about it. You're sitting there, you're listening in your headphones and do you really want a bunch of static and a bunch of background noise happening? Like that irritates well, you. Well, it's, it's 
uh, relatively inexpensive to make the quality of the sound uh, really, really good. And so it's no different than uh, why the fuck nobody sits down and watches a 1980s boob tube right anymore. <laughs> yeah. Like, you know what I'm saying? It's it, You could probably go on to eBay and find like an old 1980s television that still may work. Yeah. But who the hell is going to use that when I can go down to Costco and buy one the same size for probably the same price or less. And it's like 50% lighter. It's just, it just doesn't make sense. You, you you would way rather watch that in great quality because it's it's that easy and accessible now. That's where the sound quality is in podcasting is it's not that difficult to elevate your sound and put a little... It's little, not a big investment at all. No, it's not a major investment to have professional type sound quality. Now, now everybody thinks it's the mics that create... Now, mic, the mics do play a large it's role. environment. But good, yeah, good mics are not that expensive. You can find them on Amazon for uh, you know a few hundred bucks and you'll have a decent mic. Hey, what are these running? 250 done? These are four hundred a piece. The original ones. However, just, the original ones we had were a hundred bucks a piece. Oh, hundred, yeah. 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 See? You don't yeah, need so. you don't need super fancy mics, but what you do need is a room that doesn't echo and that has that really absorbs sound. Deadens the sound. Deadens the sound. So I have a friend who started a podcast and he took my advice to heart. And he went in his closet. In his closet, he made sure that the walls had you know blankets or carpet. Really does a good job of ab absorbing sound. Cheap foam. He has clothes already in there. We use foam on foam the sides. Tiles, yeah. And that made a huge because we could have the best mics in the world, but if I'm recording in a you know a, a tiled bathroom or a echo echoey room, it's just going to sound shitty. So that's really key. You know? and, it, and it's one of those little things that you can do that just it gets, it's one less thing someone's going to complain about and and make right. them leave. Like the, there's other things that are far like. Getting good at communicating may take you hundreds, maybe thousands of episodes to get really good at the, at your craft, right? So that's that's just flat out. That could take a long time. Where taking a little bit of money and investing in how how you improve your quality of your sound is a reasonably small investment you can do immediately, and that's just one one less thing that somebody is going to like be turned off by. So it's like to me, that's a no brainer place to kind and of. You start. automatically separate yourself and sound professional automatically mm -hmm. now in five or ten years uh everyone's going to sound really good but right now if you have good sound and someone hears you automatically you sound polished automatically you sound professional now another thing you want to do for good communication and this is something that uh, i'll give us some credit on before we even were good at mm -hmm. you know podcasting we learned how to be really authentic and vulnerable and, and this was a skill that we learned personal training clients. Yeah. So none of us did podcasting, none of us were on media, but through years and years and years of training clients, you start to learn how to be effective with what you say. And because you know, you're communicating basic information, you know, eat less, move more, lift weights, you know, here's, here's what carbs do, fats do, proteins do, and all that kind of stuff. But then you start to figure out like, wait a minute, like it's the information is important, but what's more important is, am I getting buy-in and if and one of the most effective ways to get buy-in is to sound or become authentic and vulnerable because then the person believes and trusts you. And this is it. This is this right here is key. It's funny because it's that's one of those accidental things that really worked in our benefit. I think if we were starting out and we're trying to listen to other people's advice of you know how we should run a podcast back then, it would have been the old you know entertainment style where it's like you know it has to be all scripted. You know you guys want to stay away from this type of language and yeah. you know you guys like we were just like being ourselves and and that was part of it was talking to clients and the way that you were able to relate and connect with clients was you know to. To really to be vulnerable and share stories and things that, you know, you're not awesome all the time. Like people connect with that. Now, a counterpoint that I want to make to that, though, too, is that, you know, there are different styles of, of podcasters. Um, for example, you know, we I think we would fall under a category more like. Joe Rogan and Fighter and the Kid stylistically as far right. as what so you just conversational mean, more, more conversational yeah. more just being authentic real and sharing opinions now that doesn't mean there's you can be very successful like our friend Jordan Harbinger who runs a more formatted and formal type of art he sure. is uh, you know he's been doing this for nine years he is very structured methodical uh, about his approach and his interview skills and has had a tremendous amount of success. So knowing where he's, you... He's a black belt, though, at media communication. Right, right. right. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Like, and, and that takes a long time and it takes skill dedicated well, to being it, really it, it, it takes that and, uh, you know, more importantly, a lot of... what I mean, he made a, a living off of teaching people 
uh, how to how to uh, enhance that skill because he didn't have it naturally. Mm-hmm. So it's it, you can work at this and you can prepare really well. I mean, if you if you're if you do better with that and that is your style, then I would con- I would tell you to lean into that. Mm-hmm. If you're not a natural conversationalist and you don't like talking for long periods of time and you don't ad lib well, then maybe you are better off with really trying to think about, okay, these are the questions I want to ask and talk about. This is the direction I want to take my listeners. Then I'm going to go here then and plot that out. Yeah, I do think uh, along those lines, like there are podcasts out there that that do crazy well that are really high production. Yes. And so they're, you know, and then story-wise, like stories do, do well. People love stories. And so if they're really high produced and they have, you know, clean transitions and you really pay attention to, you know, enhancing that experience, experience, you know, there's a place for that. There's a place for messy conversations. You don't know what's going to happen. Yeah. Like it's, so I, I, I think it's really determines on what your strengths, where, and, where that goes. And I feel like it depends who we're talking to, yeah. right? If I'm talking to a media personality, if I'm talking to someone who's on TV or has experienced radio, uh, or, you know, then I would say, yeah, that makes a lot of sense. If I'm talking to somebody who's like, look, I don't have a lot of experience media, but I'm an expert on hormones. I want to start a podcast then I think being authentic and vulnerable is going to be a part of their strategy. Because the media... I don't, know, I don't necessarily agree with that. Well, how, I, how do you get good at you know being like, look at us. How We well, were good in the beginning, but not because we were good well, at media. Well, again, we, we fall in that category. Right. I think there, you, you, talk to, you talk to somebody who is more like an engineer or a doctor, and that is, is a little more methodical and, and, and pay way more attention to detail and maybe a little more dry and doesn't have that personality like you have or Justin or myself, uh, they would probably do much better leaning into, you know, being more structured in the way that they deliver a podcast. Well, wouldn't that be, be authentic for them? Sure. So, sure. So, right. Sure. So, so authenticity. I just what what I what the counterpoint that I wanted to make to, to Justin, the, the great point that Justin was making is that I don't want people to think that they have to, follow in this path that we went down, which is this conversational, humanize, be authentic, be yourself, have a good time and just talk, you know, and be experts in your field. It's no, you can you can actually have a plan. And I'm trying to teach this right now to a couple people that are close to me that are starting podcasts and knowing that like one of them is a principal uh, and he is completely opposite of me or any of us mm-hmm. in this room. And I'm not going to try and say like, you know, hey, listen to how we do this and kind of have this free flowing conversation. No, that is not him. Yeah. He is definitely, you know, Mr. Anal, organized, structured, doesn't say a lot, mm-hmm. you know, but then also has, he does have a lot of valuable information to present to his audience and what he wants to talk about and a lot of experience. And he's been in the the education system for two decades now and he's very intelligent, but his his podcast will feel more very uh, more like a PowerPoint presentation yeah. than that, and and that's it. That, now that's his authenticity, sure, right? Because he's not going to copy, sure. So I think at the end of the day, the the point stands. You want to be real and authentic to yourself. And for us, it was how we communicated to clients is how we communicated on the podcast. If you're a great presenter, um, and that doesn't, in our style doesn't fit your style. I think copying us would probably be. A mistake. I would agree with you. And it's all about being authentic because in long form communication, that really does come out. When you're trying to be something that you're not, I don't think it's going to come out very well in, a, in an hour long, you know, consistent podcast that comes out every single week, which brings us to the next one, which is, and this one's funny because it's, it sounds obvious, but I'm surprised how many people miss this one is to be consistent. Mm, um, mm-hmm. You know, when, 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 when I was a kid, you watch a TV show, it came on, a certain time of the day, certain channel, yeah. you could expect you it could to show. You could count on it. You could count on it. Although podcasts are out there and they're recorded and they're available, your core audience will learn to depend on when you release an episode. So skipping weeks, I know a lot of podcasters do this. They'll release a, you know some episodes and I'll ask them, how's your podcast? Go, oh, I haven't done any in a couple of weeks, but I'm going to get back on it. You're going to kill your most uh, avid fans and listeners by doing that. This is actually the first piece of advice that I give, even before the other ones we did. Mm-hmm. And, and yeah. as because, and, and I got really frustrated with one of the two people that I'm helping right now, and I, I, that's in all capital letters, like when we were texting, I'm like, be consistent with whatever you decide to do. Start with less. You know, If your goal is to have three shows or five shows a week eventually, don't start there. Start with one time a week or even bi-weekly. Whatever you decide you're going to tell your audience and what you're going to do, 
stick to that and be very consistent to the point that I highly recommend, and I tell anybody that's doing this, you should have a minimum of 15 to 20 shows already locked and loaded and ready to go. Yeah. That way you can, you can when you first of all, when you launch, you should launch, what is it, Doug, uh, four, six, how many do you launch right away? I'd say, I'd say three at the minimum. Right away, right? The yes. first day, like three go out right away, and then I think we followed up like a couple more in a, in a, a couple. So within the first week or two, we were releasing probably six or so episodes, right? Something around there? Uh, boy, it's hard to recall. Somewhere around there, yeah, right? It's, 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 it's you're, you're, so you're, you're going to need just to get that first week because here's the thing: uh, when you first launch a podcast, uh, in the first eight weeks, you are ranked only against other people that are starting their podcast in the last eight weeks. Yeah, they call that the new and notable section. In, yes, in, in, uh, in on iTunes, and you have an opportunity to rank highly in that. Absolutely, this mm-hmm. is your best. I mean, you're, to try and compete with somebody who has built an audience over the last five years is silly. Uh, no matter how famous you are on Instagram or wh- how big your email list is, to try and uh, try and compete with someone that big already, but. If you already have a small audience of people from social media or you have some pool or you're talented and you start off getting that attention early on and getting ranked uh, in the in the new and noteworthy uh, mm-hmm. is, is really valuable. So you need to have a good plan when you first start off. You need to have a good amount of episodes that you already have stored and then you can release uh, relatively quick and then after that already be planning for what's coming the next eight weeks. So you don't get stuck like one of the people that I'm helping right now, or you know, all of a sudden the the he ran of an idea. It's like, well, dude, you can't just you know pause for a week because you didn't have a good idea, and your reason behind not going is because oh, I wanted to be authentic, like you said, and I I didn't want to just bullshit something, so I didn't do anything. <laughs> well, that's a that's fucking taking it too far. Yeah, that's yeah. a terrible idea. Like you know, spend some time in preparation and coming up with ideas. Uh, ahead of time in planning, and I know that was something we did. We 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 now we knew with our experience that we would have unlimited conversations and topics to talk about just from our experience alone. Right. But we, that doesn't mean we still didn't map out and have ideas of hey, let's. No, I think when we first started, these- we launched the three or whatever, and I think we had like ten episodes 15. or fifteen already recorded. Yeah. yeah, they were already sitting there ready to go. And because you want to be super consistent, you know, you want your, if you do build a core audience, which is what you want. And what I mean by that is you'll have a core audience and then you'll have people that pop in and out. But if you do a good job, the core starts to grow. And what you don't want to do is alienate your core audience because they're the, they're the most, they're the, they're the most influenced by your podcast in terms of revenue, in terms of, you know, what you're trying to sell or produce. Those are the people that are going to be the biggest impact. And if you release an episode once a week, every single week on Monday, and then the following week you do it on a Wednesday, a Thursday, or you skip a week, you're going to lose, you can lose a chunk of your most valuable audience. So I say, whatever you decide to go with, you got to stay with. So err on the side of less. Mm -hmm. So rather than being super ambitious and saying, oh, I'm going to do five episodes a week. Okay. How many episodes can you start with? And you know, for sure you can do consistently for at least a couple of years. That's what. That's the question you would want to ask. Now, yourself. I don't know if this uh, this falls under the be consistent category or where you would want to uh, slot this information, but I do think it's important. I remember us learning this lesson, um, and how you title matters. Uh, oh yeah. Uh, the way the podcast uh, algorithm works now, it's very sim- similar to like a Google type search. So uh, titles that are more likely to be searched or titles that jump out at people when they're looking through multiple different podcasts Mm -hmm. uh, is important. So, you know, just saying episode one and it's your name or something. So, you know, I'm saying like nobody knows who Adam Schaefer is at this point. Well, and episode three or my whatever my business name might be at that time, uh, not a great strategy. Um, doing titles that are going to grab somebody who has maybe never heard you and now they listen to you or that are more likely to be shared, um, that's important. So Yeah, I know. remember when we figured that out, it was so like, duh, because the, I mean, how do you use, how do you find things on Google? You know, it's like, what what are you interested in? Of course, uh, podcasting is going to get on that level where it's like you're just searching for an actual topic and you'll be able to find, you know, new podcasts that are covering these things. So I think there's a lot more chance in visibility if you do have that strategy. Well, we also learned later on too, when we had a, a much larger audience to where we could really separate separate this and see this is that, you know, the downloads that we have, it's not like uh, people that listen to podcast, it, a small percentage of them are the type of people that are like, I listen to every show, every show I never miss. I listen every single day. 
diehard fan. There's that's a that's a, a small percentage of the bulk of downloads that we're getting. Every Most people weave in and out or have busy lives or drop in when they can and listen to a, a podcast episode. And the way most of those people choose is they they drop into our mind pump you know, uh, iTunes screen and they look at the last five or six episodes and the title that, you know, appeals to them, they listen to it and they yeah. listen in that order. So uh, this is an important, I think, strategy yeah. for uh, for people to pay attention to when, when titling your as episodes. As far as being consistent, uh, here's another one. Practice a lot. Podcast mm -hmm. often. Uh, I could say that I learned this through fitness myself. Um, you know, if you want to get good at a squat, you squat often reps. and you practice it and practice it and you do reps. For us, this was extremely true. Again, we had zero experience with media, but one thing we did is we, we had a lot of information on fitness. We could talk fitness all day long, so we pushed it. We started out with, I think, three episodes a week, then four, now five, mm -hmm. and we just podcast, podcast, podcast. And, and what's funny with us, and this is different from person to person, but with us, it seems like every hundred episodes or so, we reach a new level of skill in terms of what we do. Mm -hmm. This was very clear early on. It was like from zero to 100, totally different than from like 150 to 250 and then every 100 or so we just get to a, a new level I think and that comes a, for practice yeah I think there's a lot of freedom in that mentality too because I know like there's a lot of people out there that are really critical and self-critical of the kind of content that they would put out and uh, fearful you know fearful of how people are going to receive it and if you if you just like have a solid plan and you know you, you record these episodes like we're talking about but you put it out there and you have it with the mentality that you're going to keep getting better and the only way to keep getting better is to just keep pumping these out and then also you know pay attention to the response and pay attention to what is striking a chord and what is not uh, with your audience it's really a war of attrition can you keep showing up week after week and putting out content and and knowing that you've got a long way ahead of you still yeah, before, you're not gonna make a dime for a couple of years yeah you're not gonna make any money for a long time you're not gonna penetrate a, a ton of people right away you're gonna it's gonna take a long time before you get a solid base where you can probably make really good revenue and can you Keep trucking along. Can yeah. you keep doing it and and keep it's a long road and and keep showing up every day? And I think that's why a lot of people struggle. It's just that I remember when I first uh, turned on Instagram with the intention to build a business around it. And I remember hanging out and meeting with Taylor and talking about this. And one of the things that I remember him telling me is that you know most people just can't stick with it. They want the attention, they want the money, they want the success, they want the business to come from it right away because they hear of, oh, so-and-so, they have this big Instagram business or so-and-so built this off of Facebook and they make millions and they compare themselves to that and they think that they're going to fall, fall, uh, follow that same path and it's just not realistic for most people. Most people that are normal people that don't have some weird talent that everybody wants to pay attention to, you know, you have to build and refine that skill, and that just takes reps. I mean, it, w one of the things I think we always love to talk about is well, amongst ourselves off air is, I mean, how many, is it 10,000 hours before you're considered a master? That's what, that's yeah. what they say. And we're, we, we talk about, we're not even halfway there on podcasting. Know, that, that, and to me, that excites me. That doesn't like discourage me like, oh my God, that's so far away. It makes me go like, whoa, we've come a long way from where we were when we first started. We still are nowhere near where we consider ourselves experts. I know how shitty of a trainer I was. Even the success that I had early years, well before those 10,000 hours hit, mm -hmm. um, I know I wasn't very good. I know how much better I became when I considered myself an expert as a trainer. And that excites me about podcasting, that you know, I'm still having hit that 10,000 hour threshold and we have a long ways to go to really improve our skill. And do you have, do you have what it takes to stick with it when you're not making a lot and of money? And that means you got to be okay with sucking. That's yeah. the hundred percent. You're totally. going to suck before you're good. So practice often, mm -hmm. um, and be okay with sounding bad at first because it's going to get better. Now, the last thing I'd say that's important, I think this is important for any business. This is, uh, it's, but especially for a podcast business is to, encourage community among the people that listen. Now, this is important because here's the deal with podcasting. It's the odds that you're going to create a podcast that's going to reach tens of millions of people is very, very slim. Very, slim. Very, very, very slim. But if you're decent, you're an expert in your field, you do a good job with all the stuff that we're talking about, you could build a community that can generate you know, a nice, deep six-figure business for yourself. But that means you need to talk to and tend to your community. 
So I would suggest doing things like building private forums, answering people's questions on social media, being uh, accessible mm -hmm. to connect with these people because that turns an audience of thousands into a bank account that potentially could look like hundreds of thousands. Well, who was the first to say it? I don't remember. Who talked about the thousand tribe first? I don't know. Do you remember who that was? No. It wasn't Tim Ferriss. It was someone with Tim Ferriss, I think, referenced whoever. I don't mm -hmm. remember who it was, but... I know um, there's a book out there called Tribe, but they I, talk about it. There's an article that. called A Thousand True Fans. Yeah, yeah, yeah. and it and it talks I'll about look for it. I'll, yeah, see who it is. I so I can give the the right person credit because I know I've referenced this many times because I 100% believe it to be really true and really close to being like spot on accurate. Like, I think it's Kevin Kelly. Uh, really? Yeah. That's not who I thought. I think that's correct. Okay, yeah, cool. Yeah. So, uh when when we got to that point where you know, and for us, uh, the best measure of this was the forum, right? The private forum um, where you had to pay access to get into this. So if you valued the us and the information that we, we were giving, the amount that it cost to get into our forum at that time, because it was a one-time fee than you were in back then. So if you if you we you saw enough value in us that you would pay to get in this private forum, we knew that you you valued the information obviously that we were providing, and you were probably a valued customer. And so those people, so not when we had a thousand listeners, but when we had a thousand people that were willing to spend a couple bucks on us to be closer to us in that forum. When that hit a thousand people, was when I think we really had a real business. When we really started to monetize and be able to make money consistently enough to start to begin to scale this business. Mm -hmm. And that doesn't mean it got easy. It doesn't mean like it all fell together then. It just meant that we got, okay, we have a real business on our hands now. We have enough loyal people that they can really, they, they were the foundation. And, uh, you know, I hop on there occasionally to and to, rem to remind them how valuable and how important they are to us and our community because if it wasn't for those first thousand people, Mind Pump wouldn't exist. It's funny because yeah. uh, we've gotten so, our views have gotten so distorted on numbers. We see things like 100,000 followers, 500,000 followers. I mean, if you, any, any business would sh die, they would kill to get a thousand customers, a thousand customers yeah. of any business. I mean, 15 years ago, you start a brick and mortar business. You got, if you had a gym with a thousand members paying you, you know, yeah, a, you're making great money. You're making great money. It's a, it's all it is. So it's no different. The difference is it's virtual, but the way you build your business is by treating them like a thousand customers. To that point. So that brings me to something that it's been on my, uh, top of mind for me because we, you know, when we went to Arizona, you know, I get an opportunity to talk to uh, a lot of other quote unquote influencers that have successful businesses and they have uh, marketing guys and teams that are supporting them that are running all the analytics. And I love that talk. And a lot of these guys that are that are doing that um, talk about, you know, oh, yeah, when we get to this conversion rate on Facebook, you know, that's when we scaled up and we were making millions and this is what's going on. And then I love to ask what lifetime value is on on their customers. And a lot of them would be like, oh, yeah. You know, when it comes to that, people are really finicky and, you know, only about 20% or less of the people buy something else from us once they buy the one. And what that tells me is that we are in a time right now, especially with the way Facebook is and Facebook ads. Most people know that that's the new Google ads and that's where the one of the best places is to advertise is on Facebook. So many companies and businesses are so focused on acquisition that they fail to pay attention to retention. And back when you were in brick and mortar and these tools didn't exist where you could acquire all of a sudden 10,000 leads in a day, which is insane, you know, before the internet existed and you had to go meet, you couldn't meet just 10,000 people in one day to make them customers, right? Mm -hmm. You had to really take your time. You got one person who walked through your store. Oh yeah. You, so what, you focused we, on how that. were you? You walked over to them, you asked yeah. them about their day, you found out about them. I mm -hmm. mean, you just red carpet that person because it is the only fucking lead you yeah. had all day long and you treat them that way. Business still hasn't changed. Not in that sense. Mm -hmm. People still want to feel that experience when they opt in and buy or purchase or experience anything within your community. And so valuing the retention piece in business and focusing your energy on that, not worrying about having this massive audience where I need to look cool on Instagram and have a million people. I'm way more impressed with somebody who only has a thousand people that are paying attention, but those thousand people when they talk about you or when they say mm -hmm. anything about your product or what you provide for them, they speak of you as like 
life changing for them. Like, oh my God, what they've done. That is so much more powerful than just having a million eyes on you. And maybe not at first, not dollars, because if you do have a million eyes and you only convert at 1%, 1% of a million is still a lot more than, you know, 20% of a, a thousand. So you're still going to get a lot more money up front on the more attention. And that's why I think so many people are focused on acquisition. But what's funny is that what people don't realize is getting the attention of a million people is actually harder, more impossible than developing tremendous value with a thousand people. The reality is it's actually, although it takes work, it's the more realistic route. Now, what happens when that thousand turns into a million? Now you've got some real power. Well, you have a company. Now, now you've got a real company doing a phenomenal job. So I would say stay away from worrying too much about gathering millions and millions of people, but rather encourage the community among the people. So that that's right. Take care of the five paying attention to you. That's it. Yeah, Take totally. care of the five, talk to them, find out what you can do better for those people. And this, this, this still reigns true in this business today. Um, you know, people ask a lot of times, like with the direction we're going and, and I know it bores people to hear like, oh, that we're, you know, oh, the 2020, we're putting a lot of energy and focus on the back end of the business. But the back end of the business is is the customer service side. It's mm -hmm. the support. Like we all care just because we're we're converting at a high enough rate that we're we're making good money. And if we were to throttle down advertising, we would three x five x the business. That's less important to us. It's more important to us the people that are coming into our ecosystem, the experience that yeah. they're getting, and we'll how can we it. how can we improve that and continue to enhance that process. Because those people are the people that you end up changing them forever. They become lifelong customers and billboards for you that go off and talk about you for 5, 10, 15 years later. Totally. And with that, go to mindpumpfree.com and download all of our resources, guides, and eBooks for free. Go check them out, mindpumpfree.com. You can also find all of us on Instagram. You can find Justin at mindpumpjustin. You can find me at mindpumpsal and Adam at mindpumpadam.